Um, so hi everyone, uh, this is a talk about the remote build execution uh, protocol and what it can do for you as kernel developers. Uh, it's a bit of a, you know, on the, on the boundary of toolchain and infrastructure, but I hope it's going to be, be relevant. Um, I appreciate this is the very last talk of the day out of all the, all the tracks, so thank you so for staying so late. I'll try not to ramble for too long. Oh, so so. you for coming. <laughs> Uh, hopefully after we, after this we'll all go to the social and, and have a good time. Uh, my name is uh, David Brasdale. I've up until recently been a, employed at Google where I was part of the Android security team. Uh, I had the privilege to uh, contribute to the uh, KVM hypervisor. We built a protected mode for ARM64. Um, and I worked on different parts of the stack, but um, I recently left and with my partner in crime, Sherban, we've started a company called Source.dev we're focusing on building tooling for um, uh, for uh, maintaining um, downstream Android uh, forks, which is driven by upcoming uh, European regulation that mandates that um, mobile devices are going to have to be uh, supported for up to seven years. And we think there's a big gap in, in the uh, tooling that's provided today for, for manufacturers to actually be able to bridge that gap from what they are providing today to those um, seven years. Part of that project, we're, we're also looking at things like integrating with kernel CI so uh, manufacturers can detect issues uh, earlier. Um, and one kind of key thing that we've identified so far is that um, this you know, acceleration of builds and making builds really fast and cheap is a, is a key to uh, providing more automation in this space. So, you know, this, this talk came out of uh, an experiment uh, on how we can leverage some of the existing infrastructure from uh, the Bezel community in, uh, in the uh, kernel space, and hopefully it's going to be interesting for you, but also, uh, you know, we've run into issues that uh, we would love to, to get your feedback on. So, uh, without further ado, what is RBE? So, um, Remote Execution comes out of uh, Bezel, which is an open source uh, build system originally developed by Google, but now it's its own standalone project. Um, it's used for very large code bases because it scales uh, very well. Um, and that's down to one key property, which is that each build step is fully hermetic. You have to define all the inputs and outputs up front and each build step is executed in a sandbox that enforces that hermeticity uh, property and that makes it really easy to cache the intermediate results, share those caches between uh, you know, team members or even across organizations. Um, and RBE, Remote Build Execution, is the protocol for distributed builds and tests that uh, underpins all of this. Uh, it's been shown to scale up to data center levels um, and you know, it allows you to take one of those individual build steps and offload it from a low power machine like a laptop or a workstation to a much more powerful machine like a, like a server. Um, and it also provides a cons consistent execution environment for, uh, for all the developers to, to, uh, to use. Um, but why should you care as a, as a uh, kernel developer? Well, first of all, um, remote build execution infrastructure is actually very widely available. Uh, and it's a fairly rich open source ecosystem. There's a bunch of open source backends which are uh, actively maintained. Um, they provide self-hosting solutions. You can run everything on-prem if you want to. Um, and there are also commercial offerings if you choose to you know, go down the route of someone managing it for you. Um, but thanks to the kind of open and standardized nature of the RBE protocol, switching between vendors is actually extremely easy. So there is you know, little chance of ending up in, a, in the vendor lock-in. Um, if, if you choose to switch, you're gonna you know, have to repopulate your caches, but you know, it's, a, it's a very minor hurdle uh, to overcome. Um, and Bezel has also been, uh, and RB has also been integrated into other build systems before. So something like Pants or Buck2 have a full native support for uh, RBE, despite not having anything in common with Bezel. Uh, and there are wrappers around common compilers, including GCC and Clang, uh, which um, you know, identify the inputs and outputs from the command line arguments uh, and, and make it possible for that individual Clang invocation to become this hermetic set that can be offloaded to an RBE backend. Um, in our uh, proof of concept that I'm gonna show to you in this, in this uh, presentation, 
Uh, we've got to the point where we can execute x86 def config builds using RBE, um, and we can see about a 60% speed up from that. Um, this, would, this number would be even larger for something like an all mod config because you're spending a lot less time on the initialization and the final packaging and you're spending a lot more time on uh, like a GCC or a Clang compilation. Uh, but as you will see, there's, um, there's features that currently aren't supported in something like RE client and some of the front ends uh, that Linux uh, build uses and uh, we haven't been able to get to the point where we can actually complete a full all mod, all -mod config build yet. Um, so uh, this is just, just an overview of the existing uh, open source backends. Most of them are developed under the Apache 2.0 license. They're written in all sorts of uh, languages, provide different means of uh, deployment. So depending on your uh, requirements, you can, you can pick the one that, uh, that uh, fits the bill the best. Um, Kind of honorary mention goes to the last one, BuildBuddy. Uh, it follows the open core model, kind of like GitLab, where the cache functionality itself is, is released under the MIT license, but the remote build and the enterprise features are under uh, an enterprise license. Um, but you know, more choice is always, is always better and uh, it's, it's good that they're, they're open sourcing at least, at least part of their solution. Um, and if you're interested in more uh, there's a link at the bottom of the slides uh, to the official Bazel directory of all the all the available um, backends. Um, so once you've selected your your backend, uh, it's time to look at the protocol itself. Uh, this is uh, this is using uh, gRPC and uh, protobuf. Uh, I've tried to simplify it as much as possible, but raise your hand if it's not uh, if it's <laughs> if it's not legible. Uh, the first thing that uh, a backend exposes is uh, this service called Content Addressable Storage. And it's just a database of binary blobs uh, that can be uh, indexed by the hash of the binary blob. So if you know the hash, you can, you can retrieve the contents. Uh, and it has just three very straightforward methods. First one is, uh, is a blob of a particular hash present? The other one is uh, download, and the last one is upload. And these are batch operations because typically you're dealing with you know a lot of very small files, so you don't want to keep going back and forth to the cache. Uh, but there's also a separate API for very large files, which I'm not mentioning here because the principle is the same. But like if you are dealing with files over four megabytes, you need to use a separate API for for downloading and uploading. Um, so with that, we can have a look at how to actually describe a, an individual build step in, in RBE. So a build step, the terminology is, uh, is an action, and it uh, comprises of two main uh, fields. The first one is the command, which is a separate data structure, uh, which just contains the command line uh, to execute a list of environment variables, just string pairs, uh, and finally, a list of uh, output paths. So anything that's that's listed there is going to be considered an output, and anything that is produced and not listed there is considered a temporary file that is that is dropped. Um, and the second part of an action is the input root digest, which is a uh, which which is a blob that points to a directory data structure and that just describes all the inputs that should be made available to that sandbox environment when that command is being executed. There's a few more fields, some of them are uh, you know, like hints to the, uh, to the backend and things like that, but this is, this is the main part that you need to populate. And as long as every client derives the same action uh, data structure, um, then that hash of that action becomes a lookup index into the action cache. So they need to derive the same action data structure to be able to retrieve the cached output of that action. Um, for that, there is a, a separate service. It's called action cache. And again, very straightforward. It has a getter and setter. So you can, uh, with your uh, action, you can uh, retrieve a action result or you can up upload your own action result um, to the cache. Action result is another data structure 
again, very straightforward. It has an integer exit code and uh, references to the standard output, standard error, and all the output files that we requested in the action uh, descriptor. Oh, what will be one particular example of an action? Uh, one, like make? One invocation of Clang. So within, within make, uh, you, you call you know, GCC or Clang thousands of times. So each one of those is one action. Okay. So you call Clang. Compile. But those messages are the ones that using this protocol you actually transfer to the, you transmit to the remote execution. Yeah. So, so basically you run your make file locally and your make file is issuing those actions. Exactly. Oh, I see. I'll, 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 I, have a, I have a diagram. Yeah, sorry, later. sorry. No worries, I was just no worries. wondering. Um, so uh, with just the content addressable storage and the action cache, what you can actually do is build a front end which, uh, you know, for every uh, build step will check against the cache. Does this exist? If not, executes locally and uploads the result to the cache. But we want to have remote execution. So for that, there is a third service called execution. Uh, and the method execute takes an action data structure, uh, schedules it on one of the worker nodes uh, in the back end, um, and returns a um, message stream, which you can keep polling, and eventually it's going to return an execute response, which contains the action result. Um, and actually, the, the back ends are quite clever. Uh, if there is an action being currently executed and a different client requests for the same action to be uh, executed as well, it can actually deduplicate those requests and return the same, uh, same message stream. So this was a bit of a uh, dumb, but if you have any questions on, on the protocol, I can, I can pause here. No? Okay, all good. Um, so moving on to the actual front end. Uh, like I said, some of the build systems implement this protocol directly, but if you don't have that, then there are tools like RE Client or BuildBox, which, uh, which can wrap around kind of common compilers. RE Client is a project that's officially maintained by Bazel. It was developed as a replacement for an older distributed build system called Goma. And but it's, it's, it's developed primarily around the Chromium and Android code bases. So the feature set that is, suppo is supported by RE client is very much driven by the needs of, of those code bases. And we're going to see that Linux actually has a slightly different set of needs than what RE client supports. Uh, it has two main components. RE wrapper is the actual uh, wrapper around the compiler command. It will, it supports um, about 10 different compilers, um, Clang, GCC, Java, and then uh, a bunch of, kind of Android specific uh, compilers, but also TypeScript, all sorts of like signing, uh, signing tools. Uh, and, and its goal is to determine the set of inputs and outputs for that particular command so it can be offloaded to the uh, remote system. And it does that by parsing the command line arguments. But in, in the case of something like CNC++, it actually needs to determine the full set of all the header files that are going to be needed during the execution of that. So it actually runs the preprocessor um, and extracts the information from that. Um, and you can imagine that that's not a free operation, uh, but actually it's a fairly well cacheable operation. So among, you know, a, thousands of executions to Clang within the Linux build, actually you, you only need to do it a handful of times. It's not, it's not too bad. Um, An RE proxy is a, uh, it's a singleton process in, uh, on the local client machine, which is responsible for managing the work, worker pools locally and remotely. So you can decide whether a particular command is going to be uh, executed locally or offloaded to another machine and figure out, you know, how much resources do I have available here versus on the server side. Um, and there, there are a bunch of pre-configured strategies for uh, how it should behave. So the default is offload everything to remote. And if there's any kind of a problem, fall back to local. But actually the one that t tends to perform the best is called racing, 
where you try to offload everything to the to the server, but at the same time, uh, you're you're also running everything locally, um, and sometimes you 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 end up completing these tasks sooner than than the server, uh, so it 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 ends up being the best for uh, for the for the local client, uh, and I appreciate this was a lot of a lot of information, but this is this is the overall uh, architecture, right? So. Uh, with Linux, we have make, invoking, all these RE wrapper uh, instances that wrap the individual client invocations. Those submit jobs to the one singleton RE proxy, which talks to the backend uh, on the server side. And the server provides the content addressable storage and action cache. Those are just databases, nothing else. And the execute service uh, which can schedule the uh, jobs on a pool of worker nodes and caches the, the results in back in the uh, CAS. Um, so nothing too complicated um, and uh, you know, something that is, is, is readily, readily available to make use of. Um, so we tried to apply this to uh, the Linux kernel. Um, at the end of my uh, slides, there's a link to a Git repo with all the configuration files uh, that uh, I've built for this. Uh, but I'll just walk you through what it actually looks like. So first of all, you need to start a backend. Uh, in this case, we'll pick uh, native link. Uh, and native link builds with Bazel. Uh, I heavily recommend using this tool called Bazelisk, uh, which just um, it deals with the complexity of picking the right version of Bazel to pick a to build a particular project. So all you need to do is just say Basilisk run and it will take care of everything. Um, a native link comes with a set of example configuration files and the simplest one is called basic CAS. It has a, a content addressable storage action cache and a local worker pool which just executes everything in, in shell commands on the local machine. Uh, I do recommend uh, tweaking that file before you run this uh, because it will create everything in the temp folder. Uh, but if you just open the JSON, you can change the paths and the maximum sizes uh, that it's gonna take on your disk. Uh, and once you run this, you will have a running RBE backend, super simple. Um, now we need the front end. In this case, this is the RE client. So again, we uh, clone the repo. Uh, I have a few patches in the Git repository for um, handling some of the flags that our e client currently doesn't support. So that's when you want to apply them. And then it's again Basilisk run. And in this case, we, we install the artifacts into a, a distribution directory. And uh, so now, now, we can, now we can call those. Uh, the one we want is called Bootstrap, which is going to start that RE proxy local service. Um, we're going to pass it some config files again. That's in the that's in the Git uh, Git repository, and we have our front end ready to go. So compiling the kernel uh, means that we have to override the Clang and um, or the C, the C compiler and the C linker uh, make variables. Um, I have in my repo a small script that just handle some of the some of the corner cases that I'm going to mention after this uh, and we can do def config and then we can actually run the build um, and RE client provides this tool called RE proxy status where you can monitor what's going on with the system so if you run that you can you can wrap it in watch and get the results every two seconds it's going to say that the RE proxy is in a good state uh, it will tell you how many cache hits and cache misses there have been how many actions are currently uh, in in progress. Uh, but don't be alarmed, uh, you will see errors. And the reason for those errors is because uh, kconfig uh, starts by probing the compiler for supported uh, feature flags. So actually it is expected that some of the initialization steps result in failed uh, invocations of Clang and our eProxy status is gonna shout saying, oh my God, everything's on fire. Uh, but don't be alarmed, that's all expected. Um, so everything 
uh, should be hunky dory. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, this is this is the problems that we run into. Um, so first of all, if you want to cache your uh, build steps, they need to be reproducible ish. And the kernel has great documentation on how to create reproducible builds. Uh, but actually, what you you know the the one part of that that you actually need is just making sure that everyone derives at that same action descriptor. Um, and the only feature that I found that uh, breaks that is config rent struct, which generates a random seed and then randomizes the layout of uh, uh, data structures. Um, and uh, this documentation file talks about how to create a constant uh, seed that can be shared among uh, among builds. Uh, so as, as long as you do that, uh, your builds are going to be cacheable. You might end up in a situation where things like timestamps were cached from the first build that executed that particular build step, uh, but the, the build itself is still going to be cacheable. If you want to make it more reproducible and actually like zero out those time timestamps, you can follow the, the guide in uh, reproducible steps, but it's not necessary. Seems to me that some of this has already been done for been all some of these pain points have already, already been encountered by, for example, C cache, which has a massive pile of different sorts of looseness it can apply to caching. You might want to steal some of those loosenesses yeah. and apply them yourself. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. I haven't I haven't looked at how much of this C cache actually takes care of, but there is definitely overlap here. Um, yep. Uh, so moving on, uh, when I was talking about kconfig. Uh, probing the compiler. Uh, this actually creates a different problem uh, because it uh, passes the uh, source file on the standard input uh, and that's not supported by the RB protocol. If you think back to the definition of the action, there is no standard input uh, content. Uh, so one way of dealing with that is you know, dumping those uh, input files into like, actual files. Uh, but it's also something that our e client can very easily detect uh, because it knows what the, all the inputs are. So if it detects that the input is a, a standard input, uh, it can just uh, you know, not offload that to the, to the remote server. That's very straightforward to do. Uh, the one that is not straightforward is uh, dependency scanner. When I was talking about s running the preprocessor to scan all the uh, header files, uh, it doesn't recognize the assembly ink bin directive. Uh, and that is used in a handful of places in Linux, like including the config uh, file in, in the kernel itself. Um, and I don't have a very good sense for how difficult it would be to actually do this properly, uh, because you start running into things like the um, you know, inline assembly being formed out of uh, multiple strings and things like that. Maybe after the preprocessor steps, this this can actually become more parsable. Uh, but it sounds like a um, you know a problem that we need to look into more uh, more deeper. However, uh, writing a heuristic with a zero false negative rate that refuses to to run anything that has ink been in it that's that's fairly cheap and uh, and reliable, so it could be like a first uh, first way of, of handling this, even though it's not the not the nicest one. Uh, and last but not least, um, there are compiler flags that are not currently supported, right? So, for example, uh, Linux makes heavy use of this um, preprocessor flag for for generating dependency files. Uh, that is very simple to add. It's just another case in a big switch statement. Uh, but another thing that I've run into is that the, the RE client expects the linker to be invoked via the Clang interface and not by calling LOD directly. Um, again, something that can be fixed, it just means that now we need to create a separate definition of a tool for, for LOD uh, specifically. So this, you know, none of these are deal breakers. Uh, but they point to a bigger problem that this is a bit of a never-ending whack-a-mole game, right? Whereas compilers continue to be developed, 
this RE client or other tools need to be kept in sync. Um, and uh, you know, bringing in new uh, new tool chains into into the RE client ecosystem is another like heavy lift that someone needs to go through bec before it can be before it can be leveraged. So we have some ideas around um, you know uh, building a front end that instead of trying to understand the semantics of the compiler is instead looking at the file operations that a, that a compiler performs during during the uh, during the execution itself. But it's not something that we're ready to, to publish yet, so maybe next year we'll come back with, with the progress on that. Um, but you know, overall, we've been able to, uh, to uh, demonstrate that uh, you know, this infrastructure that was built for a slightly different ecosystem can actually be leveraged in the, in the, in the Linux space as well. And uh, we're going to continue, uh, continue developing that and probably uh, contributing patches to RE client to, uh, to make it uh, Linux friendly. So if, you, if you're interested in, in that journey, you know, give us a shout and, uh, and uh, we'll keep you posted. Um, that's all I have. I'm happy to take questions. Um, oh. And there's a link for the Git repo if you're if you're interested in reproducing this. Okay, uh, we need to keep this short because I was told that we should not have a schedule past 6:30. What? Oh, I did not know that. <laughs> Oh. Well, well then, yeah. Um, one question. So, how do you uh, how do you deal with you know if you're falling back some remote builds to local, um, for example, the ink bin directive? How do you deal with? Do you need to have an exactly matching tool chain on your uh, local to ma and match your remote? Because otherwise, I, I I feel like you'd start en encountering issues where compilers support different features no, no. between the two. Uh, no. So the the way this is done is actually. Uh, Compiler is part of the input set, uh, so she identifies oh, okay. uh, you know, everything, including the shared libraries okay. that need to be uh, sent over. Makes and sense. part of the configuration can be a uh, container image that you know is capable of executing this on the on, on, this, on the server side. Got it. Okay, I think it was a one. Okay. I think you maybe partially answered with with that one, but what about cross compilation? I guess the uh, same. Yeah, I mean, as long as as long as you have the have the tool chain that it can be uploaded to the to the server, it's just a, it's just part of the input set. Okay, yeah, no problem there. So. Okay. Cool. Right. If we need to keep it short, then let's wrap okay, it up here. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.